This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. back to another episode of uh, Art of Darkness, uh, the podcast about the dark side of creativity. This is a dark room episode for folks who've been with us for a while. You know that means we're going to go uh, and take a second look at a subject we've covered uh, already. But first, Kevin, how are you doing? Doom, get the cash. <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm yeah. super it's, woo, it's, it's spooky, spooky season. season. It's yeah. October on Art of Darkness. And we have yeah. we have a very exciting guest. I know you're excited to talk with this fellow here, Brad. So I'll let you make the introduction. But hey, everybody, hope you're doing well. Yeah, yep. yeah, absolutely. And and Doom is sort of good for Halloween. We're doing an episode about MF Doom. If you clicked on the link, you already know that. But uh, it's pretty appropriate. You know, he died on Halloween of uh, 20. Whoa, died, I'm in the time warp. air quotes. Yeah. He's dead, air quotes. <laughs> right, mm-hmm. right, right, right. Yep. <laughs> um, about two years ago in, uh, on Halloween. So um, we are having with us um, the co host of one of my absolute favorite podcasts, Weird Studies. This is Phil Ford, who is a uh, professor, associate professor of musicology at Indiana University, um, a writer, thinker, talker. Uh, interesting man who has, uh, you know, come come along and been willing to to share his thoughts on Doom with us. So, Phil, thank you so much for this, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, and we'll kind of <laughs> just get right into this. I mean, uh, you know, it's funny. I I've been listening to your show even before our show came about, and at some point, I was like, oh, I want to get, I want to try to get Phil Ford on. And I was like, what? And w- the way we do our show is we have guests on basically to talk about subjects we've already covered or sometimes they come on with us for a core episode though that's a big lift um <laughs> so we do a lot of preparation and i remember listening through an episode and catching somewhere along the line that you um unexpectedly to me were an mf doom fan mm-hmm. so I was like, oh that's the perfect in yeah so <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> well i'm glad i glad i could give you that <laughs> yeah absolutely um and it was it was it was a treat for me to me to learn that you were into that too so um i i kind of want to kind of kick it off as one thing in your bio you say is you know you wish you had one one enthusiasm that you didn't have to apologize or explain to your academic peers <laughs> does mf doom feel like an enthusiasm you have to explain or apologize for to acad- academia not anymore no. you know these these days hip hop has gone from being a, in the, hmm, i don't know if i could exactly give a time when this happened but there's definitely a period of time maybe in the aughts where if you were doing hip hop, if you were writing about hip hop as a scholar uh, or teaching it in a course, you might have to give a rationale for that because, uh, and I'm thinking particularly in like schools of music or departments of music, which are very oriented towards the development of um, skills, usually more traditional repertories, classical and jazz, uh, even a lot of so-called commercial music programs, um, they're not really dealing with hip hop. And so, you know, for a long time, I mean, hip, when you think about it, hip hop isn't that old. No, you know, it's from the, the scheme of things. No, no, yeah. it's not. I'm older than hip hop, for Christ's <laughs> sake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, and so, I don't know. I think that among, say, music students, you might have encountered some challenges at one point where people would be like, well, is it really music if you're just saying words that rhyme? Um, or talking about sample based hip hop. Uh, well, is it really music if it's you're just taking someone else's stuff and sampling it? You're just stealing it. Right. Um, it's take you know, sometimes it takes a while for the background assumptions of a genre of music or any genre of art to kind of percolate down. So, like, you know, the higher up it's like the heads the the people who are super into the music who just you know intuitively grasp 
what it is that makes hip hop hip hop and where the art is in hip hop. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is not necessarily people who are like further down who are going to get it trickle down to them. They don't necessarily know that right off the bat. I think we are at a point now, historically speaking, yeah. um, I'm going to say this in the most portentous <laughs> possible way. We are in an age where I think people kind of, even if you don't listen to hip hop, you don't get it. You understand that it's a thing that people are into for good reasons and that there are people like doom who uh you know even if you don't listen to doom you probably have heard of him if you listen to a lot of music and you probably know he's somebody who uh nerds like us are going to get super excited about yeah yeah and, and, and he's a particularly interesting case and, and, and he's not the only one but i mean we did um an episode on on doom not too long after we'd done an episode on james joyce and, you know, you're kind of reading through, you know, I spent a bunch of time and I prepared those episodes almost back to back. So I'm spending a bunch of time reading, you know, Joyce from Finnegan's Wake and those kinds of things. And then I go right into reading a bunch of Doom lyrics. And it's not that I couldn't tell the difference. There is. But the line was blurrier than I yeah. think you might real you might think right off the bat, oh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, de there's definitely that wordplay and, and coinages and in the and all kinds and all kinds of things that work that are that are similar in the two. You know, I'm not going to compare Finnegan's Wake to Mad Villainy exactly, but <laughs> but they're but they're closer cousins than 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 one might uh, give give them credit for if they didn't think about it too carefully. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, can I can I say something about oh, yeah, that? Because actually, yeah. I'm really glad that you said that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not a Joyce guy. Never read all of anything by Joyce, but I recently, which is, I'm not saying that proudly. <laughs> yeah. I'm proud yeah. of that. Well, that's it's a just, question wow. I think we might have asked yeah. on our episode. Has anybody actually read Joyce? You know? Like... Oh, I know people who are, I mean, Joyce fans, that's a particular kind of fandom, right? Yeah. yeah the, uh, Joyce fans are a little bit like Wagnerites. Mm. Um, Richard Wagner being uh, one of those enthusiasms that I feel I have to apologize for apologize for and or explain because of course <laughs> Wagner was a notorious racist yeah. um <laughs> but uh shit I just lost my train no of we're talking about Joyce and doom and the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. lines yeah so mm -hmm. so I was just recently actually thinking about Joyce and reading a bit of um or a bit reading a bit of Joyce and uh there is something uh, there is a reason to compare doom and Joyce because you know, this is also something that I think is true of any number of musicians. I think this is true of Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. uh, who I'm not as enthusiastic about as as I am about Doom. But nevertheless, there are certain artists of words where there's a music in the words, and the music in the words doesn't. Um, it is related to the semantic meaning of the words but it's not identical to it mm. and there are passages of doom's lyrics where you can go for like a couple of verses and if somebody were to say okay summarize what he's saying here what's the message you absolutely couldn't do it right. i don't know i guess he's saying he's really good at rapping right <laughs> yeah 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 but, well I, but yeah, but, but it's that it's, it's that is that music in the words that's that's part of the deal sorry i yeah no no absolutely and, and i was listening to some more this weekend just to kind of get myself in this headspace and you realize it just it it just rolls from one thing to the from one thing to the next it's very sort of like I mean, I don't even know if expressionistic is the word, but it's very it's very much like it being just sort of inside some kind of dreamscape. And I agree. It doesn't really uh, the meat. The, he occasionally does say something that has some meat on the bones or is hilarious or is a really strong image oh, or something like that. Yeah. But but it doesn't seem to be the focus. Those things kind of emerge from this this uh, molasses like. <laughs> <laughs> a syntactical thing of which the sound of it is really kind of the the essential quality for sure um what or, do some, you... or some weird alchemy between the sound of the word and the meanings mm -hmm. uh that part of the the play the game that's going on is the sort of flickering of meaning from sound and sound from meaning i don't know if i'm expressing this yeah. well yeah yeah, no, I think that's I think that's exactly right. And I think that's always been one of the appeals of like certain strains of hip hop to me is it's sort of like, you know, 
it, it's really about it's a it's a vibe honestly it's, it's overplayed as that word is kind of now it's sort of a vibe that is conveyed by you know these things these things put together yeah. um which is you know i guess it, it, this is interesting to me you're saying you know it took a while for hip-hop to be accepted and the sampling part of that is interesting because this is a part of we remember mf doom as the rapper because it's such a distinctive sound and he's talking about things that most rappers didn't really talk about or talking about the same things but in a very different way but you know he has this whole production side which is to me just as idiosyncratic yeah. and yeah. i i kind of wondered your thoughts on like you know okay do the people who say sample based music isn't music do they sort of have a point do you understand what they're, they mean and and mm -hmm. why maybe isn't that wrong or why maybe is that a wrong opinion to have do you think uh well i don't know opinions are just opinions <laughs> true right <laughs> yeah uh so wrong opinion right opinion it's just an opinion mm -hmm. um the reason why i would stick up for sampling though that mm -hmm. that might be a different way to frame it yeah um yeah you know it's you can go back to back a hundred years to um to marcel duchamp's uh ready-mades you know like the famous urinal mm -hmm. that he just put a fake signature our mutt on yeah. Yeah, and tried tried I think unsuccessfully to get it in a, the Armory show of 1917. Anyway, big scandal, and kind of one of the cleverest moments in art history, where somebody is just sort of like, okay, to, wanting to in the a very economical way ask a question: Are you making an artistic statement if you take something you found and represent it in a new context? Which, of course, a urinal in a museum vitrine is a recontextualization of something that already exists a plumbing mm -hmm. fixture mm -hmm. uh and so in a sense this is an argument that's been around for longer than than hip-hop but hip-hop you know it's in hip-hop it isn't a, a kind of a a, a, a pointy-headed art maneuver that arthur c danto is going to write an entire aesthetic treatise trying to explain um you know the the I, I, and sampling, you're never just taking a raw slab of someone else's music. There's always stuff that's being done to that music, right? But even so, yeah, you're taking a chunk of of um, a chunk of audio uh, and repositioning it. But you know, even if you did nothing to it, and almost invariably, sample based production is a very layered thing mm -hmm. where you're going to be getting you know, drums from here and uh, you know cymbals from over there and you know the keys are from this other thing and blah, blah, blah. And you're going to layer them together. Even if you don't, let's just imagine the crudest production possible. Um, I just take a loop off of a favorite record and some, and then, yeah, it's not the most, and the continuum of creativity, not the most sure. creative thing you could do, right? But even with that, there's a composer um, still alive, a guy named Steve Reich, an American composer, minimalist composer, mm -hmm. who wrote an essay about 50 years ago, actually about the same year I was born, 1969, <laughs> um, called, uh, oh God, what is it? Um, now I'm forgetting, now I can't believe I'm blanking on it. Anyway, he wrote a really well-known essay mm -hmm. on repetitive music he was beginning to play around with doing things like taking a tape recording of a brief utterance like come out to show them it's probably which yeah. by the way yeah. steve Reich, <laughs> yeah. and mm. that come out to show them that is sampled in an mf2 in, in, album in ed villain yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely mm -hmm. interesting um so you can he made a point in that which is just like you can just take something and just repeat it over and over again and what will happen is that your relationship to the sound in that will change that uh, you will hear all kinds of things that emerging from a, a recording that you didn't initially hear, um, you will hear, it's it's as if the, uh, like, and here I'm paraphrasing, I'm sort of moving away from what Reich is saying and just kind of doing my own thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost as if the recorded sound object becomes like an object, like a three-dimensional thing. Mm -hmm. Your listeners can't see me right now, but I'm cupping my hand as if I'm holding a, a crystal sphere, mm -hmm. like in that movie with David Bowie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Labyrinth. <laughs> labyrinth. Yeah, yeah, Labyrinth. Labyrinth. That's right. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm holding like a... a crystal cod piece. Yeah. 
<laughs> so like, yeah, Matt, you know, imagine I'm holding a three-dimensional object and turning mm -hmm. it this way and that. That is a thing that happens when sound can become like a recorded thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy named uh, Mark Katz, who's a marvelous, he's a musicologist who teaches at Ch University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who is a musicologist. He's about my age. Um, and he actually learned how to be a hip hop turntablist as part mm. of his scholarly work. Oh, um, interesting. Goes yeah. by the, the, the DJ name, DJ scratch daddy. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Mark's yeah. a cool guy. And he, <laughs> and he wrote, and, it, uh, he wrote about sampling and he said, well, it's actually, you can kind of contextualize sampling and think of it within music history and compare it to other instances of quotation like quotation has been around as long as there's been any means of recording music like in notation mm -hmm. like you can go back to uh chant and find instances of quoted chant right right um but his point but cats points out he's like yeah but it's different when you quote something in a bit of notated score music versus when you sample it Mm -hmm. because and he calls the latter a performative quotation because you know if i just write down for example the notes to and this is an example he gives um to the notes to clyde stubblefield's funky drummer break mm -hmm. um which has been used as thousands a, of times yeah, yeah as a hip-hop yeah. song sample countless times um you know there's actually not that many bits of information that i need to, to write it down just to tell you what the kick is doing and the snare and the and the and the symbol and that's pretty much it mm -hmm. but if you actually listen to clyde stubblefield's recording of that the, the sample that everybody uses that's like thousands and thousands of discrete instructions in the form of digital um right. digital coding but right. like what they amount to is just like not just the sound of a symbol being struck but this particular symbol struck with this right. particular stick by this man, Clyde, Clyde Stubblefield, at a particular place in time in a right. studio and blah, 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 right. and all the details. But sure. the point is that when you sample, you're taking um, something. It's like the difference between reading someone's words on the page and hearing somebody reciting, like yes. hearing a Winston Churchill speech versus reading his words and cold type right mm -hmm. and so the the difference between just a normal like textual quotation and a performative quotation that it opens up the whole world of sample based hip hip hop the things right. that happen some of which you know reich was thinking about when you simply record something and then put yourself in a position to hear it over and over again and the kind of hidden details of music that come out you could build a whole music on this right right to some extent did that in some of his early minimalist pieces, but hip hop does it in a much more thoroughgoing way, built an entire enormous artistic practice on it. So, yeah. to, to, so to get back to your question, what would I say to somebody who's like, yeah, it's not really creative. You could uh, sample what I you just said. I would say, no, <laughs> that's what I would say. <laughs> well, see, no, you can just sample that that uh, that wonderful description and, and explanation and just send that back to them, right? Um, yeah, there's, there's a beautiful a long economy to it. <laughs> history of collage as artistic style. So sure. yeah. I don't see where there's Vis any controversy. visually. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, right. If you want to argue whether Cinema. or not Doom can play an instrument as well as uh, at, you know, name your your favorite player of any instrument then probably not no he probably can't do that um but you know it was interesting we we t ended up titling our, our episode on him um sound archaeology because we learned that like when he was young quite young he and his brother they would just get records and this was early days of sampling i mean it was five or ten years after uh, uh dj cool her could scratch the first record so people were just figuring it out and they're playing with their parents records and i thought mm -hmm. there was something very interesting about that too which is going back to the immediate prior generation and taking their audio and then like yeah. sort of seeing what does it mean to us when we break these individual parts out and use them differently? What is what is what they were trying to say? How can we sort of, uh, yeah, like sample, re, re, re say it, represent it somehow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it, and he was also digging into 
the thing is too is doom wasn't just digging in for musical audio he was digging for um you know if you listen through his whole discography you pretty much get the entire 1960s fantastic four animated series in bits and pieces all over the place and that almost the entire show ends up showing up over the course of his career you know so he's looking for all these different things to, to yeah. kind of fit these pieces in and really and really making it work um sampling yeah. is not just music it's also culture right you know right. old old school hip-hop heads will tell you that hip-hop isn't actually kind of music really it's a whole culture mm -hmm. that has as its elements um you know djing rhyming uh b-boying right. and, and graffiti, graffiti and, yeah. and people and the four elements and sometimes right. people say oh fashion that's a fifth element or whatever sure but like if you're thinking about hip hop, not even as a musical practice, but a whole cultural practice, then sampling mm -hmm. goes deeper than just the sounds. Right. It's also, um, I'm going to use a fancy and academic term for it. Excellent. Cultural bricolage. Oh yeah. Excellent. Yes. Yes. And, and that's, a I mean, a collage, kind of a collage of culture, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of how I always felt about it too. But I remember seeing a, a, a hip hop show at, my college campus and somebody saying well real musicians play instruments and i thought you know i thought about that for a while and was just sort of like i don't think you really understand what they're doing like mm. you know what i mean because mm. you can mm. and in that argument you can also say well no real real musicians bang on rocks that's what a real musician does right that's <laughs> so right like you know okay what, at what point is it real um which is which is quite interesting and speaking of real i mean we're talking about mf doom I, I wanted to make sure we hit something. Uh, I wanted your thoughts on this anonymity thing that he was doing. Like, what is oh, that? Oh, that's a what, fun topic, isn't it? I, what is that? What is that? I mean, what does that mean to you? Is, is there a tradition of that in music? Because to me, that felt like I know there's been people since, and I'm sure there's some examples prior, but that felt like a pretty dramatic statement to me to see this mask on the cover yeah. of a CD. I I'm all about the mask. Mm -hmm. I spent a significant amount of time today looking at luchador masks on Etsy. Today. Oh, really? <laughs> Love masks. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I, I aspire to I, wear I, a, a luchador mask in all doctoral exams and defenses. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm a that. theater guy. Uh, Phil and I, I adore, I love masks. I just, I can't, I can't get enough of it. Uh, it's just, yeah. cool. This goofy band Ghost, big big band now. They their last album is just mwah, Chef Kiss, yeah. and they they're all anonymous except for the main guy. There's just something about it that's so. It just it it, it always works somehow. It, it mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, mm. what do you suppose that is? If if you don't mind my turning this back on you, uh, I well, there's just something because I about agree the, mm -hmm. there is a power there, but mm -hmm. yeah, where that comes I from. think in our, well, in our culture, I think it comes from the, how much contrast, how high contrast that is, because we're a culture of narcissism, a, a culture of the individual, and there's a power to it. Uh, this, this willingness to, to um, dissolve the ego mm -hmm. and this, mm. this, it, it flips the whole thing on its, on its head. Right. I mean, we're the culture of Facebook and the, um, the high school yearbook and you, you know, we are the commodity now, our identity is the commodity. Well, and so what happens if you strip that away, it immediately makes it about the art and somehow the collective, and it's a bit of a provocation in our culture too. Uh, mm -hmm. Like this, like this band ghost. I mean, it's, it's campy and kind of ridiculous, but you don't know, is that the same guitarist that was on tour last time? Is this the same? It creates all this. Well, it's, it's simply, right. it's mystery. It creates mm -hmm. mystery. I mean, that's that's the most basic thing about it. Yeah, um, yeah I yeah. mean, I'm sure we could talk about that for a long time. It, but in, yeah. in Doom doing it in the hip hop context, which is, uh, I think, has somewhat of an elevated strain of narcissism to it. Right. Just just tip just on the typical content that you've seen in hip hop. It's a lot about braggadocio. Right. And then so to throw up a mask and be like, you don't even know who I am is a real as a real the rejection of that to a certain extent i think yeah yeah absolutely whole bunch of stuff to respond to there um one just thinking about what it is to wear a mask there's a book that i have been reading lately mm -hmm. it's called puppet 
by Kenneth, Kenneth Gross, subtitled An Essay on Uncanny Life. And so he's talking about puppets, not masks, but clearly those are related what? things, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're bits of matter, of, of dead matter that a human being manipulates, either putting it on or manipulating with strings and, or rods or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of matter animated by a human being that thereby seems to take on some uncanny quality of animation. It's like material come to life. And if you watch a puppet show, you know, there is always this little bit of like weirdness, the way puppets move, which is in imitation of human forms, but it's not like people. Um, mm. There's a reason why there's a whole bunch of horror movies uh, involving puppets, um, right. like the, like uh, Magic, the um, 70s horror, horror mm -hmm. movie with uh, Anthony Hopkins as a disturbed ventriloquist who's puppet starts taking over his mind um you know horror like that hits home because there's this sort of sense of uncanniness of something that's dead or, or non-living something that shouldn't be living is living or yeah. or as 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 gross puts it in his book you know the puppet is the mat matters ambassador to the world of human beings mm. and so if so leaving aside even the question of anonymity, if you put on a mask and that's your thing, like, you ne you know, Doom never, so far as I know, permitted himself to be photographed without the mask. No, not once he put it on. Yeah. Uh, so which, you know, once once you do that, like, clearly there's some desire to be be private, to to uh, to, to set up walls. Uh, to avoid perhaps some of that kind of narciss cult narcissistic culture that we are all unavoidably a part of. Mm -hmm. But there's also some other weird thing going on with that as well, which is uh, then doom sort of becomes uncanny, you know, doom as a, a human being wearing a mask. That's the strangest thing. All you have to do is put on a mask and all of a sudden you're a different person or even right. a different kind of entity. Right. So there's like a radical weirdness to him doing the mask thing, leaving aside all of the stuff like he, him sending doppelgangers out wearing the yeah, mask right. to perform shows for him, right. which is strange enough. Yes. But there's yeah. a kind of radical strangeness to that move, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. And, and there's there's something about it's one thing to throw a mask on, you know, as part of a theatrical presentation. And there's another thing to never take the mask off. That's right. the next level of it, because that's, yeah. that's understanding that your actual artistic project isn't just the album you put out or the and it isn't just the being on stage for an hour or two. It's actually that your entire persona is an art project. Is, is there's, right. a, yeah. there's a quality of the method actor to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and because he was creating a separate character that was a Venn diagram of Daniel Dumoulin and MF Doom, right? The mask, I think, makes it somehow... He's like, listen, the character I'm presenting, a lot of hip-hop is about is, is about a drive towards authenticity, yeah, right? The, real, right, you know, real. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you never know, like, how real are they? And like, do I actually care or whatever? But Doom's thing was like, listen, I'm, this isn't real. <laughs> this yeah. isn't real at all. And it somehow becomes more authentic because the mask is... 100 percent reliably there yes. right it's very very interesting he's it's it's operating oh, on a so bunch of levels yeah it's yeah. so interesting yeah you know no, okay i'm gonna name check some another musician mm. um who shows up in mad villainy which is sun Ra. yeah i was gonna bring up sun Ra too yes yeah you just did a great episode on space is the place yeah yeah and there's yeah. a long sample from space is a place in that that one track that everybody skips let's face it yeah. Nobody, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's listening to Mad Villainy for the stylings of Lord Quaz. No, it's true, but I like it. <laughs> That's the one uh, time. Uh, uh, oh, shoot. I'm forgetting. I'm blanking the name. Uh, I, I don't yeah, look see? At, yeah. See? But I listen to it. It's good. <laughs> no, I listen. Actually, it's funny. I, um, on the most recent, my most recent go round with Mad Villainy, um, uh, which I talked about with JF on the um, the, the Weird Studies Patreon, mm -hmm. actually developed a renewed appreciation for that track. Um, yeah, JF loved it. So, oh, good. Yeah, he yeah. he 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 had no prejudices against Lord Quas. Right. right. Um, 
Yeah. So Sun Ra, you know, when I, I teach, um, uh, at Indiana university and I teach uh, music since 1960 class, which is all different genres of music, you know, the avant-garde and opera and hip hop and, you know, you name it. I try to really kind of, kind of cover the waterfront and Sun Ra is an important figure for me. Somebody I always want to talk about uh, an important figure. I think for anybody, a really important figure of music. So, you know, the movie space is a place does actually give you a little bit of a flavor of the guy himself that he did. In fact, the way he talks and, Sun Ra in, in Space is a Place is to some extent how he talked. Like if you met him in the streets of Philadelphia, he would say many of the same kind of things that you could see him monologuing about Space is a Place. You would see him wearing the same kind of like robes, the, the neo-Egyptian robes and headpieces and so on. Like, um, you know, that scene in Space of the Place when he goes to the community center and the kids are kind of laughing at him for having right. weird clothes. Right, right. And you've got to figure that probably happened to him that all probably the time. Happened. Yeah, he's going yeah. to he's going to the drugstore to, you know, buy buy a few groceries, buy a gallon of milk, and he's wearing the robes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And so, like, and and you know, like when I teach Sun Ra, I want to explain like what was his worldview? And his worldview is like, you know, it's an unusual one. Mm -hmm. He'd say, I'm not from this earth i'm from saturn he had the whole origin story um he would say that his music is about vibration about raising vibration and creating effectively creating a new reality in music that would be more healing and powerful uh, and empowering and all that good stuff than the earth normally provides us with mm. sun ra being something of a gnostic and not having a whole lot of time for the earth right okay so like uh, or like the world, the human world, right? right? So when I show Space as a Place or or interviews with Ra or whatever to my class, I'm like, okay, so make sense of his, what he's doing here. And everyone's like, oh, it's a persona. It's like David Bowie or or, or something. It's, mm -hmm. you know, um, pro wrestling style kayfabe. Uh, that's mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. that's my gloss on what they're saying. Most people yeah. say, say kayfabe. Sure. Um, <laughs> But, it's, but a good, like, it's a good analogy. Yeah. But I was like, but if it's kayfabe, just to stick with that term for a second, hmm. then he refused to break kayfabe for like a lifetime, decades. <laughs> so this is an interesting question. And I believe in that Doom might have brought it up at some point. If you never take off the mask, it's not a mask. That's right. just who you are. That's who you are. It's not yeah. a persona anymore. Yeah. yeah. And so on the one hand, Doom would say in his infrequent public statements, yeah, well, you know, Doom is a persona and I like doing this because then I can put things in Doom's mouth that it's not what I think, but it's what mm -hmm. he would say. Right. And we all recognize that as a, you know, something we've seen in pop music goes back longer than hip hop. As mm -hmm. I say, you know, I think someone like David Bowie. Right. But at the same time, kayfabe is an interesting thing because like, you know, you get, there are some people like Andy Kaufman is a good example where like their whole thing is like never break kayfabe <laughs> ever because what they're doing ultimately, they're playing a game for high stakes. They're creating an entire reality, a right. better reality right. than the one that they got issued at birth. Right. Right. And, we're, and, and, and you can say, well, it's not real. That mask isn't your real face. It's yeah. I don't know. Is yeah. What's yeah. What do you, what do we mean by real here? Because yeah, yeah everybody's, everybody's uh, different than the way they present themselves. Right. Uh, yeah. To some degree to varying degrees. Yeah. If you, you just LARP it until you it's real. Like what's the, <laughs> it really does call into question. Like how much can you bend reality to, to, to suit your person, person to suit who you present to it. Right. If you yeah. have, if you present a forceful enough personality, reality warps to yes, accommodate exactly it. That's yeah exactly right yeah and and doom which, was doom was definitely doing that from which point of view what it what we're talking about here is magic and i'm mm. not talking like sawing ladies in half kind of magic, right right right, right? Yeah. we're talking alistair crowley uh you know using your will to transform reality ma magic 
Up uh, next on the pod, Mr. Crowley. We are. We're going to record that. He's our next score episode. <laughs> oh, no Mr. Kidding. Crowley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We're, nice. we're vibing. Hey, even the Beatles, right? Uh, yeah. Pepper. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Number nine. Number nine. That's later, of <laughs> they, course, but they, talking they, about samples. and. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Super, that's super interesting. And in, in in so doom, so I, Phil, I don't know if you know this because I didn't know this until we did the episode. The episode, and, and this is you know after years of listening to everything Doom put out. Apparently, behind the mask, he had because um, it was only one mask. There wasn't multiple masks. It was one yeah. mask that he created early on in his Doom career, and it evolved over time. Added things to it, painted it chrome, and painted it gold at times. But behind the mask, there were apparently inlays that he put in of of copper and the um, magic crystals shards of crystals oh, and things yeah, that he I remember thought hearing something yeah. about that yeah and this was part of his i mean this was part of so behind the mask it's like at the front of it's this menacing warrior kind of figure but yeah. behind it um sort of just for him is something yeah. that he felt put him on the correct wavelength to to uh, maintain this thing to get creative power of some kind um and it and it ties into i mean his lyrics don't always convey this, but I think he was, I mean, maybe he wouldn't have called it magic. I mean, we talked about too, at one point he apparently found this huge quartz crystal in Mexico and he broke it into pieces. And if you were working on an album with him, he would give you a shard of it and he'd say, this is how we're going to communicate with each other, which ah. strikes me as a very sun rock kind of thing. Like you're going to be in a, your recording studio, wherever you are. And I'm going to be wherever I am. You won't know where I am, by the way, but I'll be somewhere in the ether. And if you need to get on the same wavelength, well, you've got this piece of crystal, my friend, like magic, magic, <laughs> magic. Yeah. It's totally mm-hmm. magic. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And to who's to say it doesn't work, you know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't very, knock until you try it. Yeah, ex- exactly. It seems it seemed to work for him for him pretty well. Well, I um, mean, when you think about it, like what I love the detail of like the inlay behind the mask, like the stuff that's for him. Mm-hmm. We're so used, to, especially in a in a culture like ours, where you know everything has to be done for somebody's viewing somebody, you know, like, are you even living your life if you're not putting it on Instagram? Right. Right. Yeah. It's like if a tree falls in the forest, there's no, and no one is there to hear it. Does it right. make a sound like, you know, the, the, um, the unexamined life, we have decided that the unexamined life is not worth living, although not in the exact and not in the original. Right, sense. right, right. It's, you know like I mean? it's examined oh, by other people. Wow, you you just made that dark. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Whoa. Holy cow. Um, uh. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's like the idea of like, and I don't know if you guys ever get this feeling like doing a podcast yourself, but like JF and I joke about this all the time. Like if we're just talking and we're having a good time as friends which is what we are mm-hmm. and like we'll stop midway and be like oh we should be recording this right, for content right, right get right. the content out right yeah yeah it becomes and so very like, and you fall into podcast mode kevin and i do that on phone calls occasionally and you're like wait we're not actually this isn't a show we can just <laughs> right, chat right. About whatever well, man. like we, how are we, you doing you know yeah yeah <laughs> right we we mentioned this on the pod i don't know if you saw this on the bird website phil but this went around a few weeks ago somebody made a great joke saying men invented golf so they could take walks together and podcasts so they could have conversations <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good yeah mm, feels yeah. true yeah. no it does it does um yeah and so do well so like thinking about you know doom doing this he has this so he's constantly pushing back against being um identified i think the doom bot thing I think it's easy to dismiss it as laziness. And that might be where it started. It might have started as a like, man, you know, I got the mask. Like, they won't know if I just send out another guy who's the basic same basic silhouette. Right. Nobody's nobody will know. May have started as that. But I think it did run deeper into I think it started to make sense to him on some level that, that we're playing with layers of we're playing with layers of deception and reality. Um, And it turns out that you can just layer them infinitely. There's yeah. sort of no bottom to it, really. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think there is actually. A, I mean, I I'll say if I had bought a ticket to see Doom, and a, and he sent Imposter out, I would be pissed. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You. It would but be because a little... I 
But because I didn't buy a ticket, I can appreciate the conceptual brilliance of that move. Mm, yeah, I kind, I kind of, I kind of love it in hindsight. There's, uh, there's a great um, homage song that w- w- was put out by this guy, Open Mike, M- Open Mike Eagle, excuse me, right shortly after Doom's death, and the the narrative of it is, it's just this tribute to him. You know, he loved Doom, and it, it goes on for several several minutes. But at the end. It's open Mike Eagle realizing this framed photo that he has of Doom on stage is actually a Doom bot. He's had it on. He's had it in like his room or his studio for years. And he's like, I fi-, you know, the last I don't remember the exact. Oh, verse, crazy. Like, I finally took a good look at it and I realized that's not actually MF Doom. That's it's funny. just a good picture of the mask. You know, <laughs> uh, it's 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 kind of it's kind of crazy how deep that thing can run. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. The, in, the 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 relationship to Sun Ra is kind of interesting. I, I and it made me think like as I got thinking about this, I kind of realized this is so you guys are doing at weird studies. I feel like part of what you're doing, correct me if I'm wrong, is you're trying to answer the question, what is weird, right? <laughs> is that maybe something it's, of what you're doing? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's it's something that it's something that comes up all the time. Yeah, and you guys have now you guys have a, a course coming out, a, a course on weirding. Yes, that that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, and, and it makes me think like, is, can you, I mean, maybe we've already done it. If we try to weird MF Doom, I mean, or or did MF Doom already do all of the weirding for us? <laughs> 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 well, well, I guess, first of all, we, let's talk about that course for a second, at least. Yeah, what, sure. What, I mean, what do you mean? If Can you paraphrase what weirding means? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got the term from Eric Davis, who is the the OG in yeah. the intellectual weird- weirdosphere, um, and yeah, a good I've got friend a of ours right here. Actually, uh, I've got the uh, high weirdness. Ah, speaking of speaking of weird, oh, a masterpiece, a it masterful is. piece of writing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, Eric used the term in an interview with Timothy Morton that I heard i remember when i was cleaning my bathtub Mm. and i thought it was really apt so basically it's sort of like uh it's a little it's a cognitive move or perceptual move interpretive move sort of like queering which is something that's been around for a long time um now which ultimately queering goes back decades into even the pre-stonewall gay subculture where you know you know imagine a American culture at a very different point in its history where being gay is in fact illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, and you are surrounded on all sides by compulsory celebrations of heterosexuality. Uh, and yet this is something that we now do quite naturally. If we watch like an old MGM musical and musicals mm-hmm. are basically their whole reason for being is to orchestrate uh pairings of heterosexual lovers men and women um you start realizing that there's something really gay about some of those movies and i'm not saying that like it's a bad thing sure yeah like, just an observation you're like oh, it's what just is there's something yeah. about like the very fact that we are focusing so much on these like kind of like mating rituals human Mm. sexuality sublimated to the nth degree by song and dance um we're just spending a lot of time in the zone of human desire there is just something that's going to emerge from the background something that we're not even like reading into the situation it's something that's latent a potential meaning Mm -hmm. that's um that the perceptual strategy of queering can draw out and suddenly something that seems very banal and ordinary like an mgm musical uh like singing in the rain or something mm-hmm. seems to glow with a kind of a uh, a queer energy mm-hmm. and weird and kind of it's the same thing but what we're thinking about is not specific i mean we're not thinking specifically in the the gender context although that can play into it but for instance in thinking about mf doom Mm -hmm. um there's a kind there's a there's a russian formalist of about 120 130 years ago named victor Victor shlovsky Mm -hmm. uh a a formalist theorist Mm -hmm. art theorist um severely intellectual fellow 
anyway and uh i confess i have not read very much of his stuff but i do know this one thing he said i quote it all the time he said the purpose of art is to make the stone stony and so you think about like you know like you're walked to the corner Mm. and back and like you've done it a million times and there's a stone sitting in your neighbor's garden that you've walked past probably literally thousands of time Mm -hmm. and maybe the first day you moved in you noticed it you saw it stoniness the particular maybe it's uh got a nice vein of quartz running through it or something you know there's some particularity to it Mm -hmm. but by now it might as well be a post-it note that says stone on it right (laughs) it's It's just a it's just a signifier in your brain Mm. and that you, the way that we wear out objects, we just get used to them and we think we know what they mean. We think we exhaust what they are in our knowledge, but we don't know shit. Yeah, like we yeah. don't know anything. And when Shklovsky says the purpose of art is to make the stone stony, he's like, you know, art is capable of refreshing our, our eyes, of refreshing our senses so that we can see something as if you've never seen it before. Like seeing that stone on the very first day you moved in and and you really get its particularity, its texture, its, its thusness, the space it inhabits. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, um, yeah, you know, MF doom is a weird dude. Mm -hmm. Um, but also his music makes you hear differently. Mm. His, his way of hearing things like you get, if you listen to a lot of his music or any musician you really love, you start, it, it cuts new tracks in your brain. So it's not even like, I think a lot about like, Oh, weirding MF doom. It's like doom helps me weird everything. <laughs> that makes you know sense. What I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I really like that. This sort of thinking about the, the defamiliarization process. I mean, as a writer, that's the kind of technique that we think about as leveraging is like, oh, you got to you got to defamiliarize this thing in, in order yeah. to sort of revitalize what could otherwise be pretty banal. But like Doom does that. Doom actually helped me understand what hip hop music as a as a body of literature, say, yeah. m- was by his sort of negation of it at times. Oh, that's his, a good observation. Right. His yeah. sort of like I was like, oh, yeah, he's saying because what hip hop normally does is this. And what he does is actually like this refracted version of that. Absolutely. That kind of plays with your expectations. I wanted I was. I, I wanted I anticipated him saying this thing like, um, you know, what he does. The one lyric is what this party needs is more booze. booze. <laughs> and I, and he's, and it's like the idea is he's going to say I, I, what the rhyme is chicks or girl, whatever. But like it, the anticipation that he's going to follow the normal track. So the what hip hop would normally do so much that you almost hear it. And then when he doesn't, it's like, oh, that's what this music, that's what this genre, it does normally. This is the convention of it. And I almost didn't, you almost don't see it anymore. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Well, that was my experience. So I bought Mad Villainy when it first came out. uh, And I would like to say that I was, it was because... I was, you know, really close to the the beating heart of hip hop culture, <laughs> sure. but actually because I read about it in the New Yorker. Sure. Fair uh, enough. And there's a very, um, there was a review of it. I don't remember who wrote it that really made me want to listen to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember bringing it home and I had just moved to California. I was, um, I was on a postdoc at Stanford university and uh, my wife and two kids who were very little at the time crammed into this tiny little, tiny little house. And Mm. I brought it home and I put it on and I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. Uh, And I remember particularly the track, all caps playing it. And I just played it over and over again. And hearing the way it begins, that track begins, he's just talking so nasty. That's probably somewhat of a travesty having me. Then he called, told the people you can call me that your majesty. Sorry. I fucked up the line a little bit, but like, but you know, it, it, but there's a beat running behind it. And if you, and if I get out my slide rule, you know, if I really want to analyze it, I can sh- see the way he's playing with the beat. Almost like, mm-hmm. like pulling out a rubber band and le- then letting it snap too, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so that when he lands on a really important rhyme or really like a funny punchline or something, it lands in exactly the, on the beat. 
right? Mm-hmm. It right without in the doing of, that end rhyme thing that like hip hop did, or like you know, this exactly. is a cat and he has a bat. Without doing that, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I always think of Run DMC. My Adidas right. is a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. They just um, yell the last word at you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's um, what he's doing. He's he's, he's playing with flow, mm-hmm. such that you have this experience of time like oh, all of a sudden it's like rubber band time it's elastic mm-hmm. um but the fact that he's doing that was i had been listening to a lot of hip-hop before then but that was the first time i really thought like oh flow mm-hmm. yeah that's a thing you do when you're a hip-hop artist right you play with flow that's part one of the artistic materials you work with mm-hmm. but because he had this way of doing flow that satisfies what we expect hip hop flow to be while at the same time doing all kinds of like making it sound really close to speech sometimes or whatever mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he defamiliarizing made the stone stony and mm-hmm. he really and i and i really like your 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 piece of that it gets you listening to like the basic elements of hip hop just mm-hmm. how this stuff works as an artistic system but it puts it kind of in your face it makes you makes you really notice it mm-hmm. yeah yeah absolutely. i didn't i remember listening to mad villain because i i will say i was close to the beating heart of hip-hop in 2004 or whenever mad villainy came out 2003 something like that and i remember the first time i listened to it being like i actually don't like this ah. <laughs> and that's because i was i was trained i was in the grooves of you know i expected a certain a certain thing um and it took me probably three listens but you know it was one of those things where all of my favorite albums i didn't quite like or get the first time but you know it gets enough to to pull you through and then the, by the third time you're like oh this is actually totally brilliant i just didn't i just had a reprogram part of my my music listening brain to actually understand what i was and let myself enjoy it or something yeah for sure um I, one thing uh, i wanted to see if you were kind of familiar with because i've been thinking about it a lot so mentioned sun Ra. we all kind of know who sun Ra is and for folks who you know haven't listened to weird studies yet i mean Part of the reason I wanted to get Phil Ford on is because I want everybody to listen to Weird Studies. Your episode on Space is the Place is great, as are Thank all you. of your episodes. Um, are you familiar with the whole Nuwabian Nation thing that Doom was part of as a as a kid, as a teenager? Oh, only to the extent of looking it up okay. on, on yeah. Wikipedia. So I'm I'm not an expert. There's a there's a musicologist named Felicia Miyakawa who wrote a book on five percenter okay uh, yeah. five percent or hip-hop because that was you know that was a widespread phenomenon especially back in the 80s 90s um and that particular group is sort of like i think maybe a sect or breakaway part yeah, of five percent nation it's, it is sort of a splinter group of that but it's even it's more sort of cosmically oriented it is it does have sort of a sun Ra flavor i mean malaki York oh, indeed w- and claimed to be from outer space excuse me, different, pl- you know, the, the cosmology of the Nuwabian nation changed so much over time that you can't even really say, w- w- to say what it was about, you'd have to state the year sort of, you know, cause right. it changed so much, but it right. does make me think, I mean, we talked about our show is like, you wonder how much doom learned about stagecraft from that, right. From, from observing this, this, this guy who had created, again, he, he, he created a personality so strong and weird that reality bent to meet it. And, yeah. and you know, um, and he must That's have an he, interesting thought. Yeah. yeah. It occurred to me. Yeah. And so, I mean, this is one thing I was digging around for something we're going to talk about in the, the after dark. We'll tease it slightly. We're going to talk about one of there's two arguably last recordings by doom. Um, so maybe two of the last verses he wrote. And normally none of this Nuwabian nation stuff comes through really in his lyrical content. Um, occasionally you get little little snippets or something of it. Um, and it's hard to know even what Doom's, you know, life philosophy would have been through his music. He's not particularly a personal um you know, not particularly a personal rapper. And, and in fact, he's presenting himself as somebody he's not entirely right. There's no, right. there's no pretension to authenticity. So even if he did say something that was biographical, you know, is that Dumoulin or is that Victor Vaughn? Who, who is it that this is actually biographical information about, but one of the lyrics is very interesting. So we'll talk about that in the after dark. And I want to get 
your and Kevin's kind of take on it. And, and who gets the after dark, Brad, the Patreon oh, the subscriber at, uh, at uh, art of uh, patreon.com slash art of dark pod. Yeah. That's correct. That's the place well done. To find it. And yeah. that's also where you can hear Brad rap. Brad did rap on the after dark for the doom episode. So you yeah. go back into the back catalog and <laughs> it exists now forever. Kevin uh, made me do it, like, and then he t- like he the, tells people all the time that it's there. Uh, <laughs> like, it's the, like, the, like the like yeah. the immortal music of MF Doom and or Ricard Wagner. Yeah, Brad's rap <laughs> <laughs> is eternal. We'll live on yeah, in the cloud. We'll yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, in the cloudy, someday, in the cloudy cloud. Right. Someday, <laughs> somebody will sample. We'll sample that, and it'll be. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I will, I'll have to take him to court because it's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, you know, Phil, this makes me so MF uh, Mad Villainy album was sort of the first I take it. That's your first interface with with Doom. Yeah. You, so far as I can him? recall. Yeah. It was did 20 you years ago. Him? So sure. Did you follow him beyond that? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Once 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 I once I started listening to him, I, I bought just about everything. Right. That he put out. Excellent. What are some gems from post Mad Villainy, would you say? Well, mm, food. Love that album. Yeah. Uh, he didn't actually do that many albums where it's just him. Right. Uh, where they're, they're just pure doom album. Born Like This. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, the Keys to the Cuffs that he did with um, Gennaro. Janelle Gennaro, I think. Janelle Gennaro, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really like that one. There's one track on that called Boring Convo, which I mm-hmm. absolutely love. Mm-hmm. Absolutely love. Yeah. Um, Bookhead. I don't know what the sample is, but it is the best. It's just like this sort of farty, low brass, <laughs> like a marching band, maybe. Um, but it's sampled in such a way that it just sounds so, so ill. Like this yeah. bass, which, you know, you want that in a beat. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, some of the, and let's be real. Also, one of the greatest things about doom is a sense of humor and there are a couple of punchlines in uh, that particular track that always make me howl yeah i don't know if this is a family podcast but uh, but, uh, i i'm i i won't repeat them the the manson a little off color (laughs) this is is a manson family this is called art of darkness so you're you're all right you're all right yeah 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 don't worry about it (laughs) <laughs> no he had a very i mean he had an interesting career i mean we talked about it on we talked about it on the podcast there was a there was a point right around mad villainy where that year i think the same year mad villainy came out or within a within a year maybe not the same calendar year mm food came out um vaudeville villain came out and then one other full album came out in the same in the, in the same year and they're all like classics of the genre and this probably his best his best albums really yeah um, i don't know that he ever really like fell off as they say uh but uh that's cer- that period was certainly an incredible amount of generativity just and even even albums that people don't name check as being like his best albums like venomous villain which is his mm-hmm. other victor von album mm-hmm. uh i remember getting that and it's really funny because it's like it's really short and he clearly was pissed off <laughs> at rhyme sayers entertainment it's like the first line of the his first track is dub it off your man don't spend that 10 bucks i did it for the advance the back end sucks <laughs> that, that's right. a minneapolis outfit yeah that's yeah, right that's very, he's, mm. he's, he's, he's okay well sure. yeah. i'm in st paul disavow disavow <laughs> oh is that a, i didn't know you were in st paul yeah. I, I, am. I am i i i lived in the twin cities for 10 years that that's right? where i went oh, to graduate good. school yeah did you Met go to my wife year? You yep. go to the U. Hey, yep. go Gophers! Hey, you go are, Gophers! Uh, all right, there you go. Very nice. good. Nice. Small world. It kind of is, isn't it? I'm I'm an alum. <laughs> there awesome. you go. That's that's awesome. that's, a, that's great. Is there there's a big uh, musicology program uh, at the U? Oh, I wouldn't say big, but it's nah. a musicology program. It, it, it exists. It exists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very cool. Well, you never know who you're going to meet in the, on the uh, podcast party circuit. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe that's a good. This is a good time to kind of close it down for folks. Phil, this was this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. As expected, you made me think differently about our subject. This was fantastic, and oh, um, I'm totally glad you, delight to be here. Yeah, and I'm glad we get to share this with our audience. Um, Great. Uh, weird studies uh, at twitter.com at at weird studies. Right, I think. 
Is yeah. That, okay. Yeah. That's... At weirdstudies.com. And uh, yeah, buy the t shirt. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the weirding course, is there still, can people still get into the weirding course? Uh, last time I checked, I think there's still like literally one or two seats. All right. Left Hopefully that's seat, an quote order. unquote seats. Yeah. Since I think we're capping it. Uh, so time's running out. Right. And then the book, when does the book come out? Um, there's no specific time, but I, I'm on sabbatical this year and I am writing hell for leather because I want to get it out pretty soon. And we've got a lot of, we have a message we need to share with the world. <laughs> I know that. I know that feeling. Yeah. Are you going to, you're going to come back on the pod next year wearing like a big cape. <laughs> you come back looking like Sun and a luchador Rock, mask right? Right. and a luchador. I love that. Yeah. And the theater of the mind, they won't be able to tell the difference because we're an audio podcast. So, <laughs> but it'll be for, it'll be for us. It'll be a right. meta. meta That's, right. Sub That's right. Yeah. 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 You'll be, be able to hear it. Well, I, you got to let us shill. We're going to talk for another 30 minutes on the after dark episode. So patreon.com slash art of dark pod. I just made a new piece of merch. It's a, it's a black tote bag. And all it Ooh. says is another dead artist. Mm. So if you want to support the show, get a very tasteful tote bag. Uh, you could, you could <laughs> find go us with at... your never drew heroin tote bag in case that's yep. worn out. Yep. Yeah. You, yep. You could carry your various masks and, and other sundries there. But uh, yeah. And I want to personally thank you too, Phil. This was, was a lot of fun. Um, Dr. Ford and uh, wonderful to meet a fellow gopher. Uh, and, and let's let's uh, break here and then come back and talk more. Wait, tease, what are we going to talk about in the After Dark? One more time. We're right? going to talk about the... Um, I want to talk about figuring out what we think was the last recording of MF Doom, the last verse that he wrote. We're going to talk about two candidates. And I want to talk just a little bit about what does it mean for work to come out posthumously in particular yeah. in this particular case. Just let's talk about the ghost, the ghostly specter of a new MF Doom verse coming across YouTube. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah. We'll be back. Mmm, food. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 